Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode two of Sports Talk with Sam Teets. And if you're wondering, episode two, well, this is my new podcast. Actually, it's my new title. And if you're wondering where episode one is, you can find it on YouTube. It's just it doesn't have a picture of me. I'm actually going to double post this. I'm going to post the podcast format as well as the video format. I just want to see what gets more views. I want to see what generates more clicks. I want to see what you people seem to enjoy more. Is it just the for- is it just like the video format you want, or do you want actual podcasts? I want to see what everyone thinks of this format. So I'm just kind of playing with it right now, testing it out, which is why there's going to be a video format, which you might be watching right now. There's also going to be an audio-only format uploaded to YouTube, and there's going to be an audio format posted on uh, Apple Podcasts as well and on Spreaker. But today, we're going to be going through Clemson's entire schedule, some of the storylines going on through Clemson football, and we're basically going to be doing the Clemson football season preview. Now, for those of you who don't know, I attended Clemson University for three and a half years. I have a bachelor's degree in sports communication and history from Clemson. And I'm actually wearing my alumni shirt right now. So Clemson obviously is very close to me, uh, close to my heart in terms of football, especially at the collegiate level. So I wanted to go through and do a season preview with you. And first off, we need to start by talking about some of the losses Clemson has suffered over the past 12 months. Obviously through the draft, Trevor Lawrence. Best quarterback in college football, gone. Uh, Travis Etienne, one of the best run backs in college football, gone. He's now out for the season in the NFL level because of a foot injury, unfortunately. Amari Rogers and Cornell Powell, both gone. And Jackson Carmen is gone as well. So mainly blows to the offense. The defense actually mostly stuck around, at least for the NFL draft. Um, we do have a lot of players stepping into those roles on offense, but we'll get to those guys in a minute. The losses on defense actually mostly came from the transfer portal. De'Aaron Kendrick, who is, I think, dismissed from the program, ends up transferring to Georgia, who comes to the faces in week one of their schedule at a neutral site. I believe it's at the Carolina Panthers Stadium, I think. I'm not entirely sure. Let me check real quick. I believe it's at uh, yeah, Bank of America Stadium. So there's going to be at a neutral site for that game. That's a massive week one opener for Clemson, by the way. I don't think they've had an opponent that strong in their first game at any point during my time at Clemson. So, again, a rematch versus Darian Kendrick at his new school. Uh, Mike Jones Jr., another guy who is going to be a highly anticipated player entering the 2022 NFL draft, transferred to LSU. He was a linebacker for us. He didn't necessarily like the role he was playing in Clemson's defense. So he transfers to LSU. Probably going to fit, fit, take on a similar role. Some of the linebackers got drafted from LSU in the past couple of years. More of a traditional role that would probably help his professional stock. Uh, Niles Pinckney, who was a defensive lineman, transferred to Minnesota. And Ches Malusi, who was one of our running backs this past year, transferred to Wisconsin. So those are the guys we end up losing this past year, or at least the main guys we end up losing. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about some of the additions because we know that well, freshmen so rarely contribute immediately. So we're not really going to go over additions like we did with the Pittsburgh Steelers season preview, which is my previous episode, the first episode of this podcast that I encourage you to go check out. Some storylines for Clemson in the year. Justin Ross's return, obviously he had a congenital issue with, I think it was like a, a neck fusion. There was a neck fusion issue he had to deal with. So he gets that surgery on his neck, takes the whole year off. He's been cleared to return. But obviously this, guy, this is a guy who has first-round potential in terms of the NFL draft. He was arguably better than T. Higgins uh, during the two years they spent together. And with Ross, it comes down to me, for me at least, it comes down to how quickly does he start up. Is he going to be ready to go right away? Or is he going to have to take some time to work his way back into football shape during the actual games? Because if he starts off slow, you know, it becomes less of a major storyline until maybe around the midpoint of the season. But if he starts off playing like he was basically in his freshman and sophomore years when he was phenomenal, if he starts off like that, well, then it's full go right away. I mean, that's what we're hoping for. But, again, it'll probably take him a little while to adjust and get back into – football shape up playing through the games. Another storyline, Justin Foster, defensive end for Clemson, had actually retired after last year because of all the concerns with COVID. He already had bad asthma. So that attack with, attacked on with COVID. He just was concerned. He decided to retire. And then he ended up changing his mind. He <laughs> unretired in the span of maybe – he retired and unretired in the span of maybe six months or so. So he's back with the school right now, working his way back into the program. I expect to see a decent amount of him this year. He's not going to be a starter, but Clemson has legitimately maybe six good defensive ends that could start at a bunch of different schools. So I think we'll see those guys all rotate in 
and play some significant roles for the defense this year. Other storylines, veterans returning on defense, guys like James Skalski coming back to play another year, and just keep a lot of guys around, like guys like Landon Xander, uh, just a bunch of players who I thought could have gone to the draft or maybe could have just stopped playing football, maybe gone on to the next chapter of their lives. But a lot of those guys came back. Deion Kendrick was going to be one of those guys until he ends up having to leave the program. So that's certainly a loss for Clemson. But at the same point, Kendrick has dealt with issues in the past uh, with Dabo Sweeney and the program itself. So him ending up not being with the Tigers anymore is not necessarily a huge shock. It is a disappointment because it's a guy who had borderline first-round potential in this past year's NFL draft. He decided to come back. Everyone was excited when he decided to come back and play for Clemson. I know a lot of Clemson fans are brushing it off right now, like, oh, it's, it's not a big deal. You know, he got in trouble in the past. But, no, it is a pretty big deal not having Gary Ken- Darion Kendrick around because everyone was happy when he decided to come back. You know, now you're acting like, oh, it's not a big deal. That's not how it works. <laughs> You don't just lose a guy who's going to be a first or second round pick in the NFL draft and feel like you're at the same level that you were beforehand. Uh, one of the other storylines entering this season, obviously we're going to talk about players stepping in to replace some legends that we lost through the NFL draft. But the depth at wide receiver Clemson is another storyline story I want to keep an eye on. That and defensive end has been so phenomenal in terms of the depth and the amount of talent Clemson has put together at those positions. We'll get more into that when we do a prediction of the starters for this season for Clemson, or at least the guys who will see a lot of playing time for Clemson this coming year. The big three sophomores, I just want to mention them briefly. DJ Uwe Angelele, who is going to step in for Trevor Lawrence. And I'm just going to be referring to him for, as DJ from now on. I know how to say his last name. I just tend to catch my own tongue and mess that up quite a bit. I don't want to butcher his last name over and over again. I know how to say it. It just takes me a while to get it out. And I don't want to slow this down even further by messing up Oh, young Lele, too often. Uh, so DJ, Miles Murphy, and Brian Brzee on the defensive end, those guys are the big three sophomore-wise. They were phenomenal during their freshman years. DJ obviously only saw a limited number of snaps behind Trevor Lawrence, but when he played, he played phenomenal. Miles Murphy and Brian Brzee saw significantly more snaps on defense, and they were tremendous. These guys have all-American potential. And again, they're not draft eligible after this year, but when they become draft eligible – all of these guys right now, scouts, analysts, they all have potential first-round grades on these guys based on what they've done as freshmen. All right, now, before we get to predicting the schedule, because we're going, we're going to predict every game and the outcome of every game for Clemson. It's not that difficult, spoiler alert, but we're going to predict the stars. So for those of you who are listening, just the audio stuff, you're not going to see what I'm doing now. But I'm actually going to share part of my screen here with those people who are watching the video format, it's going to be a Microsoft Excel document that I put together that actually has a list of my projected starters for the team on it. So you can see it be pulling up right now. Hopefully that all goes through. Hopefully it looks clean. <laughs> I'm not sure how it's going to look. I haven't shared it. I don't think I've shared a Microsoft Excel document uh, through the recording this way before. But we'll see how it plays out. Let's start. Our quarterback obviously is going to be DJ. That's an easy one. Uh, wide receiver Justin Ross. Joseph Nagata and E.J. Williams. I know what you're thinking. Where is Frank Latson Jr.? Well, probably getting a lot of playing time as well because Joseph Nagata right now is dealing with a hamstring injury, I believe. Well, at least the last time I checked he was. So Frank Latson will get plenty of playing time. will get plenty of reps. Don't worry about it. He'll be just fine. I think him and Nagata have a lot to prove this year, and we'll see which one steps up because I believe one of them is going to put themselves in a range to be drafted this year based on how well they perform. It's just a question of which one is it going to be. Meanwhile, E.J. Williams, another one of those great sophomore guys. Uh, I think he has earned more targets than the guy in Ladson based on what he did last year. He showed more flashes for me. So we'll see how that plays out. And then Ajo, Ajo, I actually had to write out how, like, the frenetic pronunciation for his name based on how the announcer said his name. So I'm basically on how announcers said his name, guys. It's not me uh, creating, just creating pronunciation. This guy was built like a tight end basically last year. He cut down a lot of weight. Over the past couple of months, so he's coming in at a much healthier weight where he can play wide receiver and still have explosiveness, still have his movement. He's just very physically freakish. And he didn't see many snaps last year or at least many targets last year. But with everything going on right now, yes, there's a ton of wide receiver depth. But if, Nick, if Ross comes in, starts the year a little bit slow, kind of works his way in. Uh, Joseph Nagata is still dealing with a hamstring injury. I think a Joe, Joe could certainly see snaps 
and certainly make a lot of big plays given his physicality and just the kind of specimen he is. And I think that he has a lot of potential. It just comes down to finding that sweet spot with his weight and speed and explosiveness. Running back, I have Lynn J. Dixon. Lynn J. Dixon's been a guy I've been supporting for a long time now. I really thought he should have gotten more carries last year, especially when ETN struggled at times because of the offensive line. Uh, he, Dixon didn't. Right now, I'm hearing a lot better. Kobe Pace is really pushing him for the starting job right now. And Pace might even start week one against Georgia. I'm still going to side with my guy, Dixon, but I understand there's some thought there that he might get pushed out of that starting role. I think that the carries will be fairly split between both Dixon and Pace. Offensive line, going left to right, the two easy positions. Uh, Jordan McFadden at left tackle and Matt Bockhorst at left guard. I actually had a class freshman year with Matt. We were in biology together along with about 60 other people. So it's not like we talk to each other, but I was in that class with them. That's my fun little story from Clemson. Uh, there's been some talk. Well, at least the athletic was putting this out there as an idea. Matt's been taking some snaps in center. So he might actually play center this year instead of guard because of concerns that, well, the center position. There's, there's some concerns with the depth there. How goes like Hunter Rayburn, Hunter Rayburn, excuse me, and how Mason Trotter, the guys who would traditionally be playing center, those two have not necessarily impressed right now. So there's some thought that Matt might shift over and play center there and he'll actually bring another guard up, one possibly one of the freshmen to play left guard. I would still think you keep Matt at left guard just because of the familiar, familiarity with the position, but – if Hunter and Mason are circling that much, you really don't have much of a choice. Uh, right guard, I think everyone knows who this is going to be. It's Will Bootnam. I think it's how you say the last name. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. And then Walker Parks, the former four-star recruit, is that right tackle. Tight end, Brandon Galloway is going to be the starter again. Uh, Davis and Allen, I would expect to push him for some snaps, or at least get in there and make some big plays. But I think Brandon Galloway is probably going to be the starter by a good margin there. Galloway, it's, it's, it's interesting because – I see a pathway where Galloway makes himself draftable in the NFL, where he actually puts together a good enough season that he could be drafted. The issue is that he just – it feels like he's underperformed a lot in the past couple of years. So, especially the last season. But we'll see if tight end becomes more of a meaningful position in the offense moving forward or whether it kind of remains as a fringe position uh, next to the wide receivers. Defense, starting from the back going forward. Safeties, we know who these guys are going to be. It's going to be – Landon Zanders and Nolan Turner. There's no surprise there. Linebacker level, Trent Simpson, James Skulski, and Balen Spector. I know Balen Spector has been dealing with some injuries recently, I believe. If he's going to miss time, it's going to be Jake Venable stepping into play. Some defense there. I know Jake had some significant snaps taken this past year. So Mr. Skulski, I think, missed some time. So we have some experience at linebacker. Rotating in, again, Mike Jones Jr. has, has transferred to LSU, so he's not going to be on the team to really help out in that role. Defensive tackles. Tyler Davis, Brian Brzee. Open and shut book. Davis missed some time this past year. When healthy, he is a draftable player. He's going to probably be a third-round pick if he performs at the level that he did as a freshman or even improves on that a little bit. I think he'll be right around the third, fourth round in the NFL draft this coming year. Uh, and Brzee, again, has potential to be a first-round pick based on what he did as a rookie, as a freshman, excuse me. So two very good players. That's a very stout interior defensive front. Uh, Davis more of a run stopper, but can also rush the passer, uh, rush the passer, excuse me, and get a lot of pressure by pushing guys up the interior. Brzee is just an all-around dominant player. Hopefully he carries that into the season. Defensive ends, I have Miles Murphy and Xavier Thomas as the starting defensive ends. Uh, Murphy, obviously, again, has all-American potential just going into his sophomore year. Xavier Thomas is a guy who was a phenomenal recruit when he came to Clemson. There was so much hype around him. Uh, he was impressive as a, as a freshman. Didn't really meet the expectations his sophomore year. This past year, he dealt with COVID and a strep throat, so he's never 100%. Missed a lot of time. Now as a senior, he has all the raw athletic traits to be a draftable player, to be a guy taken in the first two days in the NFL draft, basically in rounds one through three. But he has to actually produce. He has to go out there and prove it by putting up sacks and putting up tackles and tackles for loss, something he really hasn't done since his freshman year. He's never had tremendous tackle, uh, tremendous sack totals. I think this is going to be the year he finally puts it together. I hope it is. Uh, I'm always a little bit skeptical with him because he's never hit that mark before, and he is already going to be on the older end of this defensive line in terms of being a senior, but I still have faith that he can put it together and have a really good year. 
And even if he doesn't, there's a lot of depth here at defensive end. Justin Foster, again, who I mentioned, retired and unretired, has been pretty solid when he's played. Uh, K.J. Henry is a graduate student who I actually graduated with, who's actually at my graduation. Uh, Justin Maskell, I believe is how you say his last name. I didn't actually look that one up. I should have. But he's another guy who's been a former uh, big-time recruit, I believe, former four-star, I think, maybe three-star. But he came in, and he still has a lot to prove. He still has a lot of work to do. But these guys, I mean, they're experienced players. They've been here for a long time at this point. And they certainly are going to be key parts of the defense rotation here, especially in those games when Clemson gets up by 30-plus points. And then cornerbacks, Andrew Booth Jr., Mario Goodrich, and Sheridan Jones slash Goodrich are kind of going to split time, I believe. Andrew Booth Jr. is going to be clearly going to be a star to me based on how well he performed last year. There are a lot of people projecting him to be a first-round pick in the 2022 NFL Draft. Goodrich and Jones, both are valuable players, but not at the same level right now. Uh, we'll see how, it gets, how time gets split between the two of them. I have Goodrich with a slim lead over Jones right now. Jones had a lot of playing time this past year. And we'll see how their performances early on in the year, especially against Georgia, changes everything. So we're going to go back to this form. Now, if you're, not, if you're listening to the audio, you're really missing out. But we're jumping around camera angles now. Uh, we're back to full screen. And now we're just going to do the game-by-game -game predictions. So we open against Georgia, obviously, at a neutral site. Massive game between two top five teams. I think Georgia – or is Georgia six right now? Or is Georgia five? I forget. Uh, but basically, a matchup between two top six teams in the country. Key things to note. Georgia will not have George Pickens or Dominic Blaylock, two of their best wide receivers, and Tyke Smith, one of their best defensive backs. And see, I think he's going to play safety for them this year. They're not going to have any of those guys likely. Uh, maybe Smith plays, maybe Blaylock plays, but – Cam and Pickens are coming off of significant injuries. I don't think they're going to have Smith. So it's going to be a depleted Georgia team playing Clemson. And actually, Clemson benefits quite a bit from Georgia not having two of their best receivers because Clemson's corners are one of the things I'm really worried about this year, along with the offensive line, obviously. But that's been a position of need for Clemson for quite a while now. Uh, so Georgia, I think they're going to win. Clemson's just healthier. I know there's a lot more question marks, but Georgia also, with – some of the quarterback things they're going through right now. I don't really know how much you can buy into it with JT Daniels. I don't know how much you can buy into what he's going to do at Georgia. I know there were some flashes last year. I understand that. But this is also a guy who got replaced at his previous gig in USC, I believe. And now you're at a point where some guys think he's a first-round pick. Some people are saying, no, he's probably going to be more like a fourth-round kind of guy or maybe just a college quarterback. Yeah, I really can't tell you. He played four games last year. You know, he's played a total of 15 college games in his career, five in the past two years. It's kind of hard to tell what JT Daniels is at this point. But we'll find out not too long from now. So I've got them beating Georgia, just again, because I believe in the consistency that we have on this team, especially on the defensive side of the ball this year. And I think just we have higher end players at most positions. Probably not along the offensive line currently, but at most other positions. Then South Carolina State. The second week, that should be a win. Georgia Tech should be a win. NC State always gives me up and down feelings. Sometimes it's kind of close to them. I think that'll be a win as well. Boston College, uh, Phil Dracovic, who's the quarterback for Boston College, is a good player. I know there are actually some people out there who think he could be a borderline first-round guy. There's a lot of people who will rebuke those guys for saying that, but there's a lot of thought that he could be one of the better quarterbacks in college football this year. So that's something to keep an eye on. That's going to be a matchup. I just don't think Dracovic's going to have the supporting cast around him, at least at the skill positions, to make much of a dent in our defense. Boston College usually has a pretty good offensive line, but I don't think they're going to have a good enough line to create a lot of running room against Clemson. Syracuse. Syracuse lost a lot of defensive backs this past year in the NFL draft, so it'll be interesting to see how they rebound from that. That's Pitt, Florida State, Louisville, UConn, Wake Forest, South Carolina being the Obviously, the in-state rivalry matchup in the final game of the year. Everyone's going to be hyped for that. I can imagine there might be some fists flying in the stands just based on how heated that rivalry is. College football really is like a religion down south. It really is. You never experience anything else like it in your life, probably. But I didn't even go through who's going to win those games because I honestly believe it's pretty clear cut. Everything after Georgia, Boston College, maybe Syracuse and Pitt, everything after that, Florida State, Louisville, UConn, Wake Forest, South Carolina. I feel pretty confident Clemson is going to win those games. 
Florida State, obviously a big name program, has not done a good job of developing players recently. Just has not done a good job of rebuilding that program after the Jameis Winston years and the Jimbo Fisher years. So we'll see if they do anything better this year, but I'm not really going to bet on it. Florida State is a bit of a wild card, but again, we could just go in there and roll them like 30 points. That's really how it could work. So I have Clemson going undefeated. Shocking, I know. Clemson alum predicts the Tigers will go undefeated. But the real, I mean, the real challenge is, is against Georgia. And if Uyangalele is as good as we think he is, then he should put it away. That's just how I view it. <laughs> and after that, it's, it's really not much of a tough schedule. They don't play South Car- or North Carolina in the regular season. Days. So if you don't play UNC, there's just not a lot else out there. You don't play Miami either. There's just not a lot to compete against. We already took care of UNC and Miami in previous years. So we don't have to play them this year. Um, have Clemson going to the college football playoffs. And hopefully everything goes well from there. But for right now, I'm going to wrap up episode two of Sports Talk with Sam Teets. I'm going to be doing some more team previews in the coming days. I'm going to be doing some positional rankings for both college football as it pertains to the 2022 NFL draft. I'm also going to be doing positional rankings as it pertains to the NFL in general, like the top 10 safeties in the league, top 10 quarterbacks, that kind of stuff. So you get a lot more content coming from this channel. I promise you that both in just audio only format for podcasts, which again, you can find on the Apple pod on Apple podcasts, excuse me, and as well as Spreaker. And you can find maybe some of these videos out here on YouTube where I'm just recording and still speaking to the camera just because I want to test out and again, see what works better. Do you want the audio stuff? Do you want to have the camera on? We'll all find out in the coming days as I get to watch the views pouring or not pouring. But either way, thank you for sticking around for this video. You can follow me at Sam underscore Teats 33 on Twitter. I also have a new newsletter that's coming out called Sports Talk with Sam Teats, the same as the podcast name. You can go out and check that out. And you'll get updates if you subscribe. And it's for free. But if you want to subscribe, you'll get updates on the latest posts I have. Right now we're doing a top 200 countdown for NFL players going to the 2021 season. I put a lot of work into. So you just want to go out and check that out. I would really appreciate that. And you can find the link to that on my Twitter account. Again, that's Sam underscore Teats 33 on Twitter. Have a great day, folks.